Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to the fall webinar series presented by Newton Conservators. We are delighted to have all of you here, old friends and new. My name is Beth Wilkinson, and I'll be the moderator of this virtual event. Barbara Bates is our wonderful technical director. As those of you who are members know, Newton Conservators is an all-volunteer nonprofit established in 1961, and we work to preserve and maintain open space in Newton. To learn more about the organization, check out our website at newtonconservators.org. You'll find all sorts of great information, information about the history of Newton's open spaces, how to fight invasive plants, how to start a native pollinator garden, and so much more there. While you're visiting, we'd really love to have you become a member and new members get a trail guide as a welcome gift. Tonight, we are really thrilled to be able to acknowledge three additional co-sponsors. First of all, Friends of Cold Spring Park. Secondly, Green Newton. And third of all, Mothers Out Front Newton. We're really thrilled to have them here and to have their support in this important topic. Tonight's webinar, More Than Just the Buzz by Dr. Robert Jagir, will focus on our native pollinators and the plants that support them. Dr. Jagir is a professor in the Department of Biology at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. He has been studying the neuroecology and conservation of plant pollinator systems for over 25 years. Dr. Jagir is also the founder of the well-known Becology Project, a citizen science project that uses technology to protect and restore plant pollinator systems native to New England. For his community outreach activities related to the conservation of wild pollination systems, Dr. Jagir was awarded the 2018 Regional Impact Award by the Native Plant Trust. Before we hear from Dr. Jagir, Let's hear from Alan Nogi, who's the founder and president of Cold, the Friends of Cold Spring Park and one of Newton's absolute staunchest advocates for pollinators and their plants. Alan wants to tell you about how Dr. Jagir's work helped him understand the importance of the biodiversity crisis that we are facing. Thank you, Beth, and thank you all for coming. It's a privilege to introduce Dr. Robert Jagir. His research has helped inspire me and many others to change how we see and manage our yards and parks. You probably already know that we're losing species at a thousand times the historical rate, creating a biodiversity crisis that is as existential as the climate crisis. What I love about Dr. Jagir's work is that it provides a science-based and practical approach to biodiversity conservation right here in Newton. It targets two keystone species that used to be common here, but are now rare and at risk of local extinction. Keystone species help support our entire ecosystem with cascading effects upon plants and many animals. His research helps build resilience to the impacts of climate change. It has excited many people and groups that are using his work throughout the state, greatly increasing its prospect of success. And finally, it's fun, guaranteed to bring an amazing amount and variety of new life into your yard. And I hope you come and visit our demonstration garden using Dr. Jagir recommended plants in Cold Spring Park at the entrance, right in front of the tennis courts. Thank you and welcome Dr. Jagir. Okay. Yes, thank you for the opportunity to talk about some of the research going on in my lab at UMass Dartmouth um, today uh, as the title suggests I'm gonna be focused on um, some of our, our research on the conservation of native plant pollinator systems. Um, my approach is uh, data-driven. Um, the data comes from uh, my primary research, so grad students and myself, um, but the data also comes from you, from citizen scientists through my ecology project. So you know, I'll, I'll talk about the data 
um, from both sources. Uh, and I hope that you know, you'll leave here with a better understanding of, of the problem, because I think that there um, is a bit of confusion out there with respect to what the problem actually is. Um, I'll, I'll suggest some solutions and I'll show you some data um, that, that um, supports what we're doing and, and um, simple things that you can do in your own backyard um, to, to help um, solve the problem. So I'm sure you've, you're all, you've all heard the term pollinator in the past. Public awareness of, of the, the term pollinator um, really increased in 2006 with, with colony collapse disorder in, in, in honeybees. Um, interestingly, we knew other things were in trouble, other bees and, and other flower visiting insects um, in the early to late 90s, early 2000s. Um, but the public um, at that point, for whatever reason, didn't really care about the issue. Um, so, you know, the term pollinator now, people use it interchangeably with bee. And I'm here to say right at the beginning of the talk that it is absolutely not about bees at all. Um, so, so the term pollinator, whenever you hear the term pollinator, immediately people think of bees. So that you know, there are a lot of save the bees campaigns. And as I said, it, it's not about the bees. So I, if I could invent um, a device that could feed all the bees on the planet, we would still have the problem. And that's because the problem is about the ecological process of pollination, not about the bees. Bees certainly pollinate, but so do a lot of other things, butterflies, hummingbirds. And there's this, this um, view that, that bees are the most important things out there. And, and certainly they're important um, to some degree, but ecologically speaking, they're just as important as flies. Um, and again, it relates to this, this process of pollination. And so I've divided my talk up into three sections. The first, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about the difference between a flower visitor, a pollinator, and a pollination system. Um, there is a, a major difference um, between a flower visitor and what would we consider a pollinator. Um, and people use the term pollinator um, when they actually mean flower visitor. And this, this is an extremely important point. I'm then going to switch and talk about how, um, what the problem is. The problem is that these pollination systems, which I'll, I'll you know, we'll, we'll go over what a pollination system actually is, how they're being degraded globally, um, why that's a problem, and, and what we're doing to try to figure out what the problem is and, and how we solve the problem. And then I'll finish talking about what you can do. And, and you know, most of the talk's going to be a bit of a downer, but we're going to end on a high note and talk about some of our efforts across the state um, to, to use the data that we've collected, put in habitat and make changes that, are, that, are, that we know are, are working. So they're, they're helping to prevent these um, at-risk species from, from becoming extinct, and not just from the animal side of the equation, but also um, from the plant side. So what exactly is, um, what is the difference between uh, a pollinator and a flower visitor? So a wide variety of animals visit flowers to feed on the nectar and pollen. Um, um, nectar is, the, you could think of it as a source of energy, pollen's a source of protein. Um, not everything's collecting pollen, so some are just feeding on nectar. Those animals are called nectarivores. And then the ones feeding on pollen are, are called plinivores. Globally, there are about 200,000 species. Of, of flower visitors, the vast majority of them are insects. So we've got our bees and wasps, our moths and butterflies, um, our flies and our beetles. Um, about a thousand of them are vertebrates like our hummingbird shown here. And um, there are bats and also some small mammals act as pollinators. So these, these animals are visiting flowers to search for food. And if you can, looking at the background, you can see the type of environment that they um, encounter. There are a lot of different things in bloom and the animals have to decide uh, which ones are good sources of nectar and pollen. Um, especially with the insects, there's a notion that they make decisions uh, on what to visit uh, based on innate programming. So they've got small brains. So if we put out blue flowers, we're going to attract bees. If we put out white flowers, we're going to attract moss and that's, um, or flies, and that's just not the case. So, you know, there are some specialists, meaning that they are, there is this stimulus response type reaction where we put out, they're attracted to flowers that smell or, or look a certain way, but the vast majority are, are generalists and can vis visit a wide variety of things. And what they use to, to make those decisions is the, the, the either the nectar, the pollen content of the flower. 
So how do we know this? So the other side of my research, it was mentioned, I focus on neuroecology. This is understanding how, how the brain works to, to mediate the interaction between the, the animals and the flowers. Um, so we have a monarch butterfly here. If you touch the legs with sugar water, um, there's an innate response. It sticks out its tongue looking for food, very similar to Pavlov um, uh, and, and his dogs. Um, so what we can do is we can show the butterfly a color. We can present it with an odor, a shape or a combination of, of color, odor, and shape uh, for a few seconds. We, we um, touch the legs with the sucrose solution. As soon as the, the proboscis or tongue touches the sucrose solution, uh, there's an association made between reward. So we could think of that as the nectar and, and the, um, the color yellow. If they had an innate preference for these colors, as soon as we showed the color, we would see it sticking out its tongue looking for food. And we don't see that in, in the monarchs. So during the testing phase, we show different colors. We show blue, we show a color similar to the, to, to the train color, yellow. So we're in the oranges and reds here, nothing happens. And then as soon as the um, test stimulus is presented, we see immediately the butterfly sticks out its tongue looking, looking for food. Now this butterfly, even though its brain's the size of a pinhead, not, not only can it, is it migrating to Mexico right now, which is a remarkable feat in itself for something with a small brain, but it can remember that association for um, close to a month and it can remember colors and odors um, for, for weeks at a time and, and reverse these things. So the vast majority of what these animals are doing is, is based on learning and memory, okay? And they're very good, especially the bees are, are really good at learning and, re and remembering um, the properties of flowers associated with reward. So if our flower visitor, as it's searching for food, okay, as a consequence of searching for food, if it happens to transfer pollen, leading to fertilization and the production of seeds and fruit. Okay. So we're switching things now from the animal to the plant then, and only then do we, can we change the name from flower visitor to pollinator? That's the only time that we can use it. So this right away, you can see hopefully that the term pollinator has nothing to do with the animal. It has to do with the plant. I can certainly hand pollinate a plant, right? So it's, 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 it's just a different vehicle, but the process of pollination is absolutely plant-based and it isn't just about transferring pollen. Why is that? Well, because many plants are what are what's called self-incompatible. So if I have a, an animal that's transferring pollen from this flower to this flower on the same plant, if it's self-incompatible, then there isn't going to be any fertilization or production of seeds and fruit. So there, there's no pollination going on. If it's self-compatible, it will be mating with itself effectively. And certainly there are many plants that are like that. Those that are self incompatible, if they transfer pollen from here, those most plants, because um, when they transfer their pollen to an unrelated individual, that increases the genetic diversity of their offspring, which is a, a good thing. Um, so what they want is for, for that animal to take pollen from this plant and transfer it over here. Then this process is, is called outcrossing. So plants have a wide variety of different strategies. They may have the male and female. So the males, uh, produce, or sex organ produces the pollen stigma is the female, um, reproductive organ. The pollen attaches to the surface of the stigma pollen tube grows down. We get fertilization and we get development and production of seeds and fruit. So I, I, from the plant's perspective, then this, that entire process is pollination and any animal that completes that process is called a pollinator. Now it seems straightforward, but what people do is they see a bunch of bees in this case on a plant and they assume that they're all pollinators. Now let's look at this example. We've got two bumblebees. We've got Bombus fervidus up here, Bombus fervidus, and, and this is an obedient plant. Bombus fervidus is, is entering the flower to get the nectar, which is located at the base of the flower. And in the process, it's contacting male and female reproductive organs of the flower, leading to fertilization and seed set. So our Bombus fervidus is a, is a pollinator. Our Bombus affinus here isn't going in the flower. It's standing on the outside of the flower and biting a hole at the base of the flower to steal the nectar. It's called what's called a nectar robber. And it is not touching the male and female reproductive organs, and therefore it is not a pollinator. In fact, it is a parasite in this case because it is stealing nectar and not giving the plant anything in return, right? There's no benefit to the plant because it's not helping the plant reproduce. In fact, by stealing the nectar in this plant, it's deterring our pollinator, Bombus fervidus, because it will visit the, the plant and there won't be any nectar because Bombus affinus has stolen it and it will reject the flower. So there's a cost to the plant of having these individuals. 
um, the, these um, just flower visitors, those that aren't, aren't acting as pollinators. And I could have thousands and thousands of Bombus affinis on these plants. And without Bombus fervidus, I won't have any pollinators. I'll just have flower visitors. Um, similarly, I could have take the plant out of the equation and put a feeder in and have tons of Bombus fervidus and tons of Bombus affinis feeding uh, um, on, the, on the nectar or the, the sugar water that I would provide them. And they're not pollinators. They're simply flower visitors or, or nectarivores. And we can't call our Bombus affinis a pollinator until, and this is an absolutely critical point that people for whatever reason miss, we cannot call our Bombus affinis a pollinator until the plant that it pollinates is there and it's actually pollinating it. So there's this notion that if we put out whatever and we have a bunch of bees or whatever visiting the flower, that, they're pollin that, that we're assuming that they're going to be pollinators at some point in the future, I guess, is the way we use it. So the term pollinator plant, pollinator habitat, pollinator this, pollinator that is absolutely meaningless. You need to look at what those animals are doing. And if they're not helping the plant, they're not pollinators. And so there's a big difference right here. I'm separating feeding animals, which is giving them nectar and, and increasing pollination um, products or pollination events. And that, in that case, we need to understand who's pollinating and who is just visiting and robbing the nectar. Now, from the plant's perspective, they're going to try to deter our Bombus affinis. And what's interesting about Bombus affinis is on the endangered species list, and it's the poster child for quote unquote pollinator decline. And in fact, it's a terrible pollinator of tubular flowers. It's programmed to go and steal nectar from tubular flowers. So it isn't, you know, certainly it pollinates other types of flowers to some degree, but it, its special skill to compete with other flower visiting animals is to rob flowers. That's, that's the skill that gets it. And that's, that's why well, it's not persisting because of things we're doing, which we'll get into, but there are other nectar robbers like Bombus affinis, Bombus tricola, sister species that is still present in Western mass um, that does the same thing. To, to, to put this into um, context, so we increase the number, here's the Pineland golden trumpet. Here are all the, the things that were observed visiting. So we've got non-skipper, skipper, butterfly, short and long tongue bees. Only the ones circled actually pollinate. When they enter the flower, um, they get pollen on their proboscis, their tongue, and they, they transfer the pollen. So if we eliminate these three, but yet we still have three, six, nine different species covered with, with um, butterflies and bees, we don't have any pollinators. The plant is not benefiting. And we're going to see as we move forward why this is so important, why we need to think about the plant. This whole issue is actually a plant issue. It's not a bee issue. Um, and so we need to bring it, it, you know, both of those sides of the equation together if we're going to hope to help anything. Um, okay, so things get a bit more complicated when we look at what these animals are facing um, uh, under natural conditions. So I showed you some examples with single plant species. In reality, there are a lot of things in bloom. If you go out into an old meadow right now, it's filled, filled with five species of goldenrod and aster. Um, through the summer, there are a lot of different things in bloom. And as I said, each of these animals has to decide which, what, what, what offers the, what's the most rewarding. Um, and so we've got, uh, in this case, our bee, but we could have, have had a butterfly here is flying to make a choice. It's leaving this purple flower. Um, it could decide to go purple, purple, purple. From the plant's perspective, that's a great pollinator. That's ideal from the plant's perspective because it's picking up pollen and transferring it to um, a, another plant of the same species that, that's unrelated. But if our, if our bee in this case decides to go from purple to, to the pink one, to the yellow one, back to purple, from the plant's perspective, the bee might be um, get, getting maximizing its, its, ener its energy intake, so nectar intake or pollen intake. But from the plant's perspective, this is bad because what happens is, is that the pollen from the purple plant is being wasted, right? Male gametes are being wasted. And also when the pollen is deposited on the female, um, the, the surface of the stigma, what it does is it prevents it from receiving this plant from receiving its own pollen. So pollen from its own species. So there's a cost from the male side and the cost from the female side, re re reproductively speaking, um, to the plant. And so plants want the animals to their pollinators. So they, they want to attract their good pollinators and get their good pollinators to, to, to specialize. 
the animals don't care. So there's this battle back and forth between the animals and the plants. The, 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 the animals don't care about plant reproduction. And, you know, honestly, the, the, the plants don't care about the, the animals feeding. Um, they're trying to get re reproduction and the animals are trying to get food, which ultimately leads to their reproductive success. And that's going to contribute to population. Um, and so if we look globally, as I mentioned, we have 200,000 species of, of these flower visitors and we have 1,000 animal pollinated plant species. Um, and there isn't a single animal on this side that can, that can pollinate everything on this side. And there isn't a single animal on the, or plant on this side um, that could feed everything on this side. What we see is we have subgroupings, right? So we have a plant and it's pollinated by a subgroup of the animals on this side. And we have animals on this side visiting a subgroup of plants on this side. And if we consider the, ant, the plant and all of its pollinators, good or bad, everything that contributes to pollination, um, that is called a pollination system. So the reason that my title has pollination system and not pollinator is because people equate pollinator with flower visitor. Pollination system forces you to think of the plant. And from this point forward in the talk, and this past my talk, you know, as you go about your daily lives, um, I want you, whenever you hear the term pollinator, immediately think of the plant. There has to be a plant involved for you to use that term pollinator and think about that as a unit. The plant and animal are one. Um, and, and that's, we're referring to that as a pollination system. So just to give you some examples of pollination systems, so there's a wide range of these pollination systems. Some are, uh, uh, bumblebees are their primary pollinators here. The plant has, there's a good fit between the, the flower and the animal that does the pollinating. So in this case, um, we've got our flower and we notice that the pollen is on the thorax or the back of the bee. Why? Because it's very difficult for the bee to groom the pollen off here. Um, and that maximizes pollen transfer efficiency, um, which is maximizing the, the reproductive um, success of, of the plant. Uh, others are pollinated by hummingbirds. Here we see that the pollen is transferred to the forehead of the hummingbird. Why? Because if it was transferred to the wings, it wouldn't be a very efficient way to transfer pollen. Right? The nectar is located at the base. The, the bird moves in to feed on the nectar. In the process, it rubs its forehead against this. And this is the female reproductive structure up here. So it moves to another flower. As it slides in, it's transferring pollen here and then picking up pollen and then it'll move to another flower. So very efficient system. Um, here is uh, a, what's called a specialized system. So this is one animal and one plant. If we remove the animal, the plant dies. If we remove uh, or, or eventually will go extinct. If we move the plant, then the, the animal will go extinct. So it's a one-to-one. -one. Uh, here's the pollen. We can see that the tube, it's a very long tube and this fly's tongue is, is really long. It goes down to about here. Um, and so there's a good fit there in this fly pollination system. And then we, here we have a butterfly pollination system. We can see the, the uh, pollen on the proboscis as it's probing around for nectar, it's picking up the pollen and transferring it um, from flower to flower. So all of these systems are equally important, right? Each of these animals is equally important. Why? Because when we look at pollinators, we have to look at it from the plant perspective. Bees are not good pollinators of this at all. In fact, this plant is trying to deter bees. Why? Because the bees are going to go in and take the nectar without making contact with male and female reproductive structures. So the color red actually isn't to attract hummingbirds, it's to deter bees because they're less efficient at exploiting flowers that are red in color. Um, they also, these, these flowers tend to have dilute nectar that the bees don't prefer. They want more sugar content in their nectar. All of these are plant tricks to try to deter bees while at the same time attracting or, or maintaining pollination services by their ideal pollinator, preferred or most efficient pollinator, which in this case is hummingbirds. Okay. Um, so to give you an example, then here is uh, a bumblebee pollination system. This is a bumblebee pollinated plant um, and it's a bottle gentian. Hopefully you can hear this bee probably better than you can hear me. I'm trying to keep this mic in my mouth so you can hear me. Um, but the uh, petals of the bottle gentian are, are few fused together and bumblebees are the only thing that has the strength to get in to get the, the nectar um, and you can see eventually our bee is buzzing and crawling its way in and it'll get down and get the nectar and it comes out it's grooming the pollen right and it's going to move to another bottle gentian now only about 20 percent 
30% of bumblebees actually find the nectar in a bottle of gentian. So you may ask, well, why is the plant um, not attracting 80% of the, of the um, pollinators that it could? And the answer is because those few bees that actually get the nectar in this bottle of gentian, there's so much nectar that they'll search far and wide for another bottle of gentian. And that's the plant's way of maximizing pollen, um, pollen transfer efficiency. So, um, and so, you know, again, the fuse petals and they're special, this plant is specializing on bumblebees. So again, instead of the, using the term pollinator, we, we could use animal pollinated plant. So if, if, if we have, instead of saying pollinator garden, you can say you have a garden with animal, a lot of native animal pollinated plants. That's the proper usage of, of the, of the term. Okay. So ho hopefully at this point, everybody, sees the difference between a flower visitor, a pollinator and a pollination system. Um, so if we look at the problem, then the problem is that these systems are being degraded at an alarming rate worldwide, both from the animal side of the equation and the plant side. So if we look at um, bumblebees, so uh, around 2014, 2015, I started to collect data on um, bumblebee species in Massachusetts and compared it to historical data. So before 2000, as I, as I mentioned, the, um, these declines in bumblebees started around the uh, late 90s and really picked up in the early 2000s. Um, so I, here are some data from 2015, 2019, um, and we can see that um, you know, um, there are many cases where the yellow bars are, are lower than the blue bars um, if they're there at all. So Bombus aphanus, um, there's no bar because Bombus aphanus is, is um, likely locally extinct. Um, we see also Bombus fervidus. There's a small bar. Um, other declines here is Bombus tericola, which is that sister species, that whole biting species that's a sister species of Bombus aphanus. So, so definitely many species in decline. Butterflies, same thing. Everything uh, below this line right here is in decline. And um, other bees, same, same deal. Um, and we can flip things over to the plant, animal pollinated plants, and animal pollinated plants are also declining. So we've got, again, th these systems that, that plant and its pollinators are declining. Now, the one thing I want to point out here is that you'll notice that in the case of bees, butterflies, and plants, we see some cases where there are yellow bars that are higher than the blue bars. So while it is true that there are some species that are in trouble, that some are probably locally extinct, others are headed in that direction rapidly, there are others that are doing just fine. In fact, whatever we're doing to drive some to extinction, others are thriving and they're becoming more abundant and they're increasing their distribution. And this is another major point. Just because you see a whole bunch of bees or a whole bunch of anything on a plant does not mean that it's a healthy system at all. This time of the year, you're going to see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bees, and it's all one species. This one, Bombus impatiens, the common eastern bumblebee, when there should be three other species that are um, uh, abundant as well, and they're no longer there. So here we separate abundance versus diversity. We can't treat bumblebees as a group or butterflies as a group. We have to look at the species, and there are some species in trouble, and there are others that aren't. So obviously, if we're trying to help these systems, we want to focus on the systems that need our help and not the ones that don't need our help. The problem is that everything that's going on under the, the, the uh, pollinator decline uh, umbrella is just helping abundance. It's not helping diversity. And so we're going to, we're going to shift and start to focus on more on diversity. So why should we care, right? As I mentioned at the start, it is not about the bees. It is about the process of pollination. And hopefully you can see why the pollination is important. Certainly, I'm sure you're aware of, of this context where pollination is important, agriculture, because this is what it, th this is why public, public awareness increased. And a lot of the so-called pollinator conservation groups jumped all over this. One out of every three bites of food we take comes from a pollinator, and which is a bee in this case. Um, but I want to point out a couple of things. Certainly this context pollination is, is important and it's, it's received a considerable amount of attention. The one thing I want to point out here is that in an agricultural context, the most important animal doing the pollinating is, is a honeybee. Honeybees are, are non-native. Um, the reason honeybees are so good is because in one of these little boxes, you get 10 to 30,000 individuals. 
and the job that they need to do in terms of pollination. So it's not the bee that's important. If we had 30,000 other bees that were available, it, they'd be just as good. Um, what's important is that all of what we see here, acres and acres of one thing, monoculture, gets pollinated. Everything needs to be fully pollinated. And to do that, it, it, it takes a lot of individuals, a lot of animals doing the pollinating and the honeybee fits that role really well. So we've got mostly non-native species. We have a handful of native species like the common Eastern bumblebee that I just mentioned that's used to, 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 to pollinate um, tomato in, in the greenhouse, blueberry, and some other things. So a handful of native species to pollinate a handful of plant species that aren't native. They may have been native at one point, but we've modified them to the point that they're, they're similar, but in some cases, but in some cases, um, nowhere near what their, their ancestors are like. And these, the pollination events, right? So this, these are artificial systems that we've created are feeding one species and that's us. And we could throw in, you know, domesticated animals if you want as well, but a handful of species pollinating a handful of species, uh, basically servicing one species. And obviously we're important. So this is extremely important. Don't get me wrong. The honeybee plays an extremely important role here. But what I want to point out is that of the, you know, there, you know, the, two to 4,000 native bee species, thousands of butterfly species and flies, only about five, I'll give you 10%, but realistically it's around 5% of native bees and other things actually visit crop plants and are effective pollinators. So 95% of them aren't, aren't even important in this context. And so when we talk about conservation and save the bees and, and which effectively is save the honeybees, we're ignoring the species that actually need it, those that are going extinct in this context with that focus, because if you only have a couple of individuals that are hanging on, they're not going to be your major pollinators here. You want to get numbers. So it's all about bee abundance in an agricultural context. When we flip that over to an ecological context, the game changes completely. And this side of the equation has been completely ignored. That is that these pollination systems, the native pollination systems become important. Why? That's because the products of pollination, so we've got our pollination system, we've got our animals pollinating our plants, the seeds and, and, and fruit. Um, so the products of the pollination are providing food, shelter, and nest sites for other animals, other native animals. So small mammals and birds are feeding on the seeds. They're using um, the, the um, plants for, for nesting sites and, and for shelter. And those animals are feeding the predatory species, right? So our owls are eating our voles, or in this case, our, our um, this is a desert ecosystem, which doesn't really apply to this area, but uh, the idea is the same that we have. Um, the, so the, the, the more of these systems we have supplying food, the more diversity we can support on this level and the more diversity we can support um, through these, these ecological webs. So we can think of these systems as the foundation of ecosystems, right? that if we have a wide range of these systems, the plants, the wide range of plants that are, are the, the anchor of the system are providing a variety of food that's feeding a variety of animals. So because of these interactions, these are called keystone interactions because their interactions, the interaction between the animal and the plant leading to pollination has a positive cascading effect throughout the system on many species. So when we save bees or we save butterflies, we're saving one species. When we save its functional role as pollinators, we save multiple species. And that is achieved by pollinating native plants because all of the native plants and all of these native species have co-evolved together and coexist. We can think of it as, as, as a balance. So function and diversity of ecosystems is really rests on the shoulders of, of these pollination systems. So here, the honeybee doesn't play any role. The honeybee is non-native. There is no, not a single native plant that depends on honeybees for pollination because they didn't co-evolve. They didn't evolve here. And so what happens in these systems is that because we have a limited resource, the nectar and pollen aren't unlimited. Um, when you have a lot of individuals coming into a system, competition increases and you get winners and losers. That's just the way it goes. If I had increased um, Bombus and Patience, a native to that level, we would get competition effects as well. So it's, it's, it's inevitable when you have a limited resource, the more limited, the more competition, the more species are going to lose out. So it doesn't play a role in this context. Now in the agricultural context, it plays the main role. And a lot of these native, native species in these systems, certainly the native plants don't really play a role um, in an agricultural context. 
So why is this important? And that that's because um, these healthy and diverse ecosystems provide us with ecosystem services. Um, these are services we get from nature for free, like uh, water purification, carbon sequestration, soil decomposition. Um, and, and as we start to erode, as we start to um, knock out our foundation, we start to remove these pollination systems, we remove the plants, we remove the animals that are doing the, the, the bulk of the pollinating, eventually we'll get to the point where we remove too many too much of our foundation, and we're going to get what's called ecosystem collapse. And we're going to lose all of these services that we get uh, for free, and we 100% take for granted. And we're going to have to figure out a way to, we're going to have to invent a way to replace them because, you know, and if they're, if we can replace them at all, and we just need to look at China where they've wiped out all their pollinators and they have to hand pollinate all their fruit trees. And um, now they're using, you know, dropping bubbles and with, with pollen and, and figuring out ways to replace pollination as just one of many ecosystem services they've lost because of, of, of um, you know, eroding these, these um, systems, degrading ecosystems. All right. So, um, so it's, um, it's interesting. The slide is a bit out of order, but I can talk about this now. So, um, well, what I'll do is I'll introduce this and then go back to that slide because um, we're, we're moving to the, the next part of the talk where we talk about now we know what the problem is, right? How do we, how do we fix things is the next part of this. And, and as I said uh, before, and I'm just going to use another example, that what we want to do here is we want to increase pollination products, right? Native pollination of native plants, increase those products. And we do not want to just feed flower visitors. So here's another example where we have um, native plants on this side. We've got Lobelia, Monarda, and we've got um, jewelweed that are all visited by hummingbirds and pollinated by hummingbirds. And then uh, on this side of the equation, we've got a hummingbird feeder that everybody loves. We get lots of hummingbirds. Um, and so if we think about things from just the bird's perspective, of course, we're going to put out our hummingbird feeder. We can feed tons of birds, one-stop shopping. Um, the problem is that if we put out our feeder and the bird has the choice between visiting plants and, and pollinating and visiting a feeder, what are they going to do? Well, of course, they're going to pick the feeder. Here they have to visit hundreds of flowers. Here they have to just get unlimited resource, go back to their nest and, and, and just make trips back and forth all day. This is saving the birds. Here, we're saving their functional role as pollinators. And so by doing this, we are knocking the, um, we're, 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 we're preventing that cascading positive effect from, from taking place. So it's far better to plant monarda, which you don't need much of it, to feed those birds that are going to be pollinating and producing seeds for, for other birds. Um, than it is to put out these feeders. The other thing I want to point out here is that there are many, many non-native plants that these animals do feed on, right? The problem with this is, is that this is effectively a feeder. Even if they're pollinating here, the birds don't like the seeds. The butterflies don't like to use these na non-native plants as host plants. And it makes perfect sense because they, they co-evolved with plants from here that they're not going to like things from other places that they didn't co-evolve with. And so even though you might see a lot of activity on your non-native plants, you are, you've completely lost their functional role as pollinators and the importance that that ecosystem, those ecosystem services that I talked about. Okay. So what is that exactly is causing the problem? There are a lot of um, factors that have been proposed, um, causal factors. Pesticides are getting a lot of attention, neonicotinoid pesticides. Climate change is a big one. Disease. So that's disease moving from honeybees to, to native bees. Um, my lab, by the way, is studying all these factors. I've been studying the um, disease um, transfer pathogen spillover, you know, since grad school. Um, habitat change, habitat loss. So these factors, certainly pesticides and, and, and disease from honeybees, the pesticides in particular, this is, this is a problem in urban areas and agricultural areas, but we're still seeing declines in areas where there's no pesticide exposure. And before the neonix came on the market, we started to see declines in areas where they weren't used. So there's clearly something else going on. Um, and I think this and, and others that are looking at these declines and trying to figure out cause, um, habitat change, habitat loss is the primary driving factor. Certainly these factors are amplified by 
pesticides and, and disease transmission. Climate change is a big one. What happens is the, the animals and the plants go out of sync. So the, the plants blooming, the, the, but the animal's not there to pollinate. Um, and the plant goes out of bloom and the animal's looking for food and it's not there. So that's simply how you can put things out, out of sync. So I'm going to talk today and I certainly could go on for a few hours on pesticides, climate change and disease, but I'm going to focus on habitat change, habitat loss, because the simple solution here is don't use neonicotinoid pesticides or herbicides because we know that they um, negatively affect the plants and the, and the animals, right? So that's an easy solution here. Things are a bit more complicated because we need to figure out what are we doing to the habitat? What are we changing um, that's having a negative effect on some, but increasing the abundance of others? And so what, what I've started doing, right, and, and we'll, we'll get into this in a, in a bit more detail, is I use what's called an ecological approach. And that is that we're going to focus on the species that need it, and we're going to figure out um, what are the important components that help them complete their life cycle, okay? So in the case of a butterfly, um, they have to have a host plant, right? So that their larvae have something to eat. And then they also, as adults, many of them need um, plants to nectar. So the nectar is their source of fuel, helps them to produce eggs that they lay, and then they'll go back into this stage. For bees, this time of the year, they're going September, October, they're going into hibernation mode. They need a place to hibernate. In the spring, they'll emerge from hibernation and they need a place to, to nest, right? They need nest sites. Once they find a nest site, they need nectar and pollen to help them. The pollen um, is the way they make new bees. Um, if you think of it that way, and the, the nectar is their, their source of fuel. So a bumblebee can live maybe 24 hours without a nectar source, but it can live for you know a few months without pollen. So, um, but it can't, they can't make new bees. So you can see lots of bees around, but, but you're not making any new bees if you don't have good sources, good pollen sources. And we'll talk about that in a second. So my research is focusing on what those species at risk need, because we really don't know what they need. It's, it's, it's shocking to me, um, how little research is going on related to, um, what the needs of these different species in, in decline, um, are. And also there's no research, little research on the major pollinators of the plants that are in decline, the native plants in decline. And so we're trying to fill some of these knowledge gaps. Um, and so when we, the first thing that we, you know, I mentioned that there are some species that are increasing and some that are decreasing. The other thing, um, you know, this idea that one size fits all, so all bumblebees are doing the same thing and all butterflies are doing the same thing and all other bees are doing the same thing is absolutely false. So here we have butterflies and here are their flight times. And you can see some butterflies are, are later, they're made, their peak flight time is, is later in the summer, some are earlier. Um, here is a bee that's in trouble and notice that, that it finishes its life cycle um, at the beginning of June. It's in and out and done um, for the year uh, by June. So if we don't have nectar and pollen for this bee, and you can see it's feeding on willow, which is a major source of nectar and pollen in the spring. If we don't have something available for this bee, it's not going to make it right. We have lots of things. Most of the quote unquote pollinator habitats that I see have things that start blooming in June and really peak in August and September. You got all your golden rods and asters. This bee is not going to be on those landscapes because you, you have, uh, most of them don't have anything in the spring. Our bombus fervidus, our bumblebee that's in trouble, um, it needs, it, it emerges in the spring and it, it uh, basically goes into hibernation late summer, early fall. And so we, it needs to be supplied with nectar and pollen to complete its cycle over the entire season. Other bumblebees are start and finish earlier in the season. So each species has a, a different, uh, what's called a phenology. And that's true of the plants. Plants bloom at different times. And so you know, in order to support this bombus fervidus, it's going to be moving from one plant species, it'll go out of bloom, it'll have to find another one, and we have to make sure we maintain it through its life cycle. Um, so there's, there's a bit of detective work. But the question is, a lot of things are in bloom at different times, which ones, which plant species does this bee prefer for to feed on for nectar and pollen? Um, and so it turns out, you know, in terms of just to follow up on the on the, the timing issue, which is a major issue, that the vast majority of this, the, the species at risk from the animal side are out and active really early, right when the snow melts. And so willow is an absolutely critical resource, any type of willow, multiple willow species, because the willow is here, all of the bee species that are threatened 
are going to be visiting the willow for nectar and pollen. All of these butterfly species are going to be visiting for nectar. And there's one butterfly species at risk that uses it as a host plant. So just by planting a few willow, you're able to support the animal side of the equation. And then we can start talking about the, the plants. They certainly pollinate the willow, um, but we can talk about other plants that they would pollinate to, to, to fine tune the, the, the plant side of things. Um, but just one species makes a huge difference early on when you wouldn't think that anything's blooming or anything's around. So when we start to think about what these species need, we have to think about what, what they're, um, you know, as I said, there's a good fit between the animals and the flowers. What is the fit? So in some cases here, we've got um, species with short tongues. So we can divide our species based on their tongue length. Some bees have short tongues, some have long tongues, butterflies have shorter tongues and longer tongues. Here's a, a medium tongue bee, Bombus impatiens, feeding on goldenrod. And you can see it just walks. You can see its tongue moving out. It's just poking around, getting the nectar. We then have long tongue bumblebees like our Bombus fervidus. So here they are down here. Um, these two have long tongues. And when goldenrod's in bloom, these species aren't touching goldenrod. You won't see one of these species on a goldenrod. They're looking for a match for their long tongue. So they're on the jewel weed. So you can have hundreds and thousands of acres of goldenrod and aster, and you are not helping at all the, the situation in terms of these species that are in decline. Start putting in the jewel weed, start putting in other things that, that are, are tubular, and you'll start to support um, these species later in the season. The reason is because their long tongue gets in the way. They're not good at competing with short to medium tongue species on here, just like the short to medium tongue species can't compete here. Their tongues aren't long enough to get the nectar, which is located at the base of the spur of, of our, our jewel weed. So again, everything is separated out. There are these sub certain plants that fit with certain animals, and we need to really think about those matches. And so the problem is that when we look at what people are putting out there and promoting to save the bees and save the save pollinators, um, we see this one size fits all approach, and we don't see any consideration of their functional role as pollinators of native plants. For example, we look down for bumblebees. Um, clover is a major source of nectar. It's a non-native, um, but it, it's a major source of, of nectar for, for um, the species at risk because it's got a long tube. And yet it's not even checked here. Um, we continue down. We have a lot of non-native species. Um, and we have here a native rose. I assume this is a native rose, although it's not defined as such, which is preferred, but it's a pollen source, not a nectar source. And so what we need to do is we need to start to replace these. And some of these aren't even visited that often. So this idea that you can go down a list and just pick three or four things and you're helping is, is completely um, false. And I just mentioned the goldenrod here. Um, and, and so what, what's going on is that these lists are just really feeding the animals. They're not considering pollination. And here's another example that I pulled off the web these seed mixes for bees, you know, bees, buddies, uh, bees, knees, all these pollinator mixes. Uh, effectively, here's what we have. We have a bunch of non-natives and cultivars, which aren't good. And I'll talk about that in a minute um, that are catering to short to medium tongue and effectively catering to honeybees. Sim similarly over here, the bees, knees, there are a couple of good plant species, but as I said, we need things that are blooming nectar and pollen sources for the whole season. And, and, you know, with the ornamentals, cultivars, non-natives, this is just feeding the animals and not, not, protecting or restoring their functional role as pollinators. And so we need to shift things. So what, what are the matches, the native plant matches for these species at risk? And so what I started to do in around 2015 was to go out to areas and say, okay, well, the bees will tell me what they want, right? This is this idea of umwelt, um, German term, looking at things from the perspective of the animal. And I'm teaching animal behavior right now. And I, I, you know, mentioned this the first day of class, we all have to think like, like the animal, they have different sensory and cognitive abilities than we have, and we have to consider that. And so I went out and surveyed um, sites. My first site was at, at Breakneck Hill in Southboro, and I've been surveying that since 2015. Um, and, and just looking at what the bumblebees were doing, were they, were they visiting, which flowers were they visiting, which plant species were they visiting for pollen or nectar? Was it a male worker or queen? And I compiled all those data and I did the surveys weekly from March to October um, and, and looked at the data. 
Um, the other source then, because, you know, there's a lot of ground to cover and, and I'm just one person and I do a lot in a day, but I certainly can't cover the state. So what I did then was I thought that it, because of the, a lot of people are concerned and have very good intentions uh, when it comes to this, this issue of pollination system degradation and, and, and decline um, that, that I would start the, help getting citizen scientists to help me to collect data. And that's when I started the Becology Citizen Science Project. When it started, it was just to help me to collect data. But we're at the point now where not only do we have data, but we're actually, um, we've got the plants that they prefer and we're putting them in the ground. And so they are now, um, the becologists are involved in assessing the, the habitat quality and then um, using the data that they collected to, to put in these habitats to restore and protect these, these native pollination systems. And I'll, I'll finish with that. So this, this, I, there, you know, there are hundreds of ecologists at this point. I hope that some of you are, might be interested in, in helping out either with the data collection or, or creating these habitats that we can then survey to see how good these plants are at restoring systems and increasing the population size and, and of, um, of these, um, animal species that are, that are at risk of local extinction. And in addition to figure out who are the good pollinators and, 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 and figure things out from the plant side of things. Um, and so to help do that, I've got uh, a web app. So if you go to the Becology website, becology.wpi.edu, teamed up with um, Carolina Ruiz and Elizabeth Ryder from Worcester Polytechnic Institute. So they're the tech side of things. Um, we are now uh, teamed up with iNaturalist. So we're bringing the iNaturalist API in. We've expanded, I know it's called Becology. Started with bumblebees because they're fairly easy for citizen scientists to ID. Uh, but we're now expanded to include butterflies, moths, and, and pretty much anything that's visiting flowers so we can get more data on the interaction. And so we're very interested in, you know, there are a lot of these, um, citizen science projects related to pollinators or bees out there. And they're more focused on where the bees are. Uh, we're focused on what those bees are doing. I want to know how they're behaving nectar and pollen, what they're visiting um, at the species level to, to try to, to figure out um, what the needs are of, of these species of, of conservation concern. And so if we look at the data that I collected since 2015, um, there are some, so here are results from July. And, and what we see is there are very clear differences in what species prefer um, to visit for nectar, what, what plant species they prefer for nectar. So even if we divide up, so here are the short tongue species, medium tongue and long tongue, we see that there are definitely some common things. Red clover and vetch are really what are keeping these species existing, keeping them from going locally extinct at this point um, in these old field areas. Um, but you'll notice that within there, there are some, some other preferences. So there are 25 plant species where I observed at least one bumblebee visiting for nectar. Yet in this case, 100% of the visits of Bombus fervidus were on just two of the 25 plant species. Right. So everything there, um, well, more than 50% of the observations. And we're talking, I think at this point, I've got 20,000 observations there, there, um, we see the same pattern over 50% of the visits, um, are to just one or two plant species and within these tongue lengths. So even though they're the same size, same tongue length, they're doing very different things. This, uh, Bombus impatiens loves purple loosestrife. These other species, even though purple loosestrife is really abundant, they don't visit it at all. Um, so these very clear preferences and then these sub preferences, which are very interesting. And I'm figuring out it has to do with nectar chemistry and we're figuring out exactly what, what the preference is uh, for a lot of these species. If we look at pollen, so remember pollen is the way they make new bees. When I looked at pollen collecting behavior, um, this was shocking. 25 plant species where there was a bee foraging on a flower um, and um, only two species where they actually actively collecting pollen. Meadowsweet and St. John's wort. So this tells us that for whatever reason, and we're trying to figure out the reason that they really like certain plants for pollen, presumably because they're high quality, higher quality than the other um, plants that are available. And so if we don't give them these pollen plants, they're not going to have, be able to make those new bees. They're going to have trouble putting out the males and queens and, 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 and making new bees. And that could be a bottleneck in the system. The other thing is that all these species are looking for the same plants. So the competition here is, is, is really intense. They're all using a limited number of plant species and trying to get the pollen as quickly as they can. And that is going to set up the winner loser effect, which is amplified by abundance 
And so, you know, that that's one idea is that these species aren't just aren't getting the pollen that they need to make it through the season. So the take home here is that there are certain plants that are good for nectar, certain that are good for pollen. Uh, what's interesting then is if we look at the ecology data for July, right? So this is all citizen science data. Um, there, are, I think uh, this is just for July since we started, there are a few hundred observations. Uh, if we target the species of conservation concern, vegans, tericula, and fervidus, we see the same pattern. So our, our um, preference data that I collected every week, you know, intensively surveying 40 acres um, at, at each site, you know, taking a lot of time, we're seeing the same patterns emerge from our ecology data. So that shows that these species actually do really have these preferences and it helps to confirm what I found. So this is, this is the, the value of this ecology um, project is, is, is incredible. Not only getting people to help make the changes that we need to make, but to get the data and to confirm my data and help to speed up that process. So I, you know, I can't thank the, the ecology participants enough for, um, for their help. So all of these data have now been put into a plant list that I have that, um, so, you know, Based on data, I generated a plant list and, and all you need to do is go to uh, my lab website, jagirlab.weebly.com, download the plant list, and you can look at, um, you know, you can assemble plants, you can look at your habitat, uh, your, your, your garden or your, your landscape, see what's miss, missing and look to the list and put in the species and um, know that you're helping. And I'll, I'll show you that, you know, some examples of this, but one thing that's really important for me is you don't just take the list and plant. I want you to know that you're helping. I want you to see these species of conservation conserve show up on the, on the flowers um, so that you actually know that you're making a difference. The list includes butterflies at risk and other bee species that are considered at risk as well. Um, and so you can look at a particular plant. It has information on bloom time and, and a variety of other things. So just to give you an example, so reconnecting these native plants with the, the bumblebee species at risk, here's a list. So, you know, if we had to create a habitat um, starting in the spring with lupin and wood betony, that the, um, native, all of these are native plants moving into the pensamin hirsutus, pensamin digitalis. So putting out these plants for nectar and these ones for pollen is enough to support these three species. And we're also, some of these plant species are in trouble, lupin and, and the, the pensamin hirsutus. And so we're not only helping these species, but we're helping to restore the, the pollination, restore these plants and their connections with the, with the rest of, of the, the ecosystem. Um, and so the one thing that um, here that, that I want to touch on briefly is that, that, that cultivars, so when we look at this plant list and these plants, um, all of them are straight species, but there are a lot of cultivars that are out there, right? So either hybrids or they're, they're variants of the straight species. And here's just an, an example of all of those species um, that are out there. I'm going to focus on, on echinacea. So we have our, our straight species here, and then here are the, the color variants and, and um, phenotypic variants that, that um, are out there right now. Um, and so when you look at visitation to these, so Annie White at University of Vermont did this, but I have done this in, the, in you've seen this in the numerous times over the 20 or 30 years that I've been studying plant pollinator systems. Here is the, the purple bars show the, the straight species, and then we have the color variants. And you can see that, that in the case of bumblebees, they're virtually ignoring some of those color variants. So you're not giving them the same thing, even though it looks showy to us and we love it. And it's perfectly fine if you want to breed ornamentals, um, if you're into that thing. But in terms of conservation, using cultivars is, should be avoided. Okay. And the reason is because when you are creating these cultivars, so you're, you're breeding them for show, you're breeding them for cold tolerance, that the plant has to give up something. So you're going to make a bigger flower. Those resources that go into making a bigger flower have to come from somewhere and inevitably they come from nectar production. And so even though you have something that looks good to us, it doesn't have that nectar or, or, or you've affected the pollen or nectar quality or, or, um, quantity and that that's going to affect the animal behavior and and you're not going to to be able to um to support them and so here's an example of a hybrid cultivar of lobelia carnalis here's the straight species and here's the cultivar it looks identical 
um, to us, but to the hummingbird, here's the, the nectar for the Lobelia cardinalis. Here's the nectar for the hybrid. This bird is just going to avoid this plant altogether. Um, and so even if, 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 if it could pollinate and produce just as many seeds as the straight species, you're not going to get any visitation that's going to affect um, the, the, those pollination products that I talked about. Okay. And I could give you 20 other examples of this. And, um, you know, so it, it, avoid those, those cultivars. So what can you do to help to restore these systems? As I said, you can participate in, in the Becology Project. Um, just email me um, if you're interested in, in learning more. I give workshops all the time on, on how to use the app. There's a video on how to use the app, a lot of resources that I can, I can direct you to if, if you're interested. And I, I really hope that you do want to participate. Um, but as I said, it's not just about you know, putting plants in the ground, I want to make sure that you have the skills to be able to assess the quality and then also to make changes and see that you've made a difference. And so the first step of this is to take an ecological inventory. How many native plants do you have on your property? How many non-native plants do you have? Do you have the, the animals, those, those animal species at risk, the pollinator species at risk? Um, if you don't have, um, if so, if you have these species and we, this is what we see, the veteran red clover supporting um, all three of these species, what you want to do then is introduce some of the native plants that they um, pollinate. And then um, as those plants become more abundant, you can start to reduce the non-native plants. So that's, that's a strategy. But in order to, to adopt any stir, create any strategy, you need to understand what you have to begin with. Um, you have to, and to do this, you need to learn to identify your targets. So the Becology app helps you to identify, all you do is take a short 10 second video and it'll walk you through IDing the bumblebees. Soon it'll, it'll do the butterflies and everything else for you. Um, as of the spring of 2022 is when we'll launch the, the merged uh, app with iNaturalist. Um, but, but you need to know what these species look like. So here's a Bombus fervidus that's in trouble. Um, here's Bombus tricola. Here's the common species. So this, you know, e even if you're not a bee expert, um, looking at this is very different than looking at this is all yellow with a black band and this, this is, is um, black without the yellow. So um, learning to identify those species, butterflies and, and bees and, and who the players are. Um, I have a, a resource on the Becology site that you can download to help you to ID those bumblebees. Um, I'm happy to email it to you, just send me an email. The other thing is you need to identify those, those targets. So um, uh, from the plant side, so the bumblebees at risk tend to, to prefer pollinate the native plants with longer tubes. And so you want to go out and see those native plants that you have. Do they, are they, do they all look like this? Do they, they have um, tubular flowers um, to help you to, to understand um, um, the plant side of, of the equation? Um, so it may come down to just removing the non-native resources versus adding anything. So here are some data from Breakneck Hill, which is my main study site. Um, and uh, so we knew we've got about 30 acres here. There's an area down here, a wet meadow area that's filled with purple loosestrife. Uh, lots of purple loosestrife um, means lots of honeybees and lots of the common eastern bumblebee, but none of these species at risk. Um, and so what uh, we did, um, you know, what, well, what I did, what Freddie Gillespie did at Breakneck Hill was to, to remove the purple loosestrife. And um, just after three years of removing the purple loosestrife, we have um, mimulus coming into bloom, all these native species. We've got swamp milkweed, um, Joe pieweed. And interestingly, with this mimulus population that was suppressed because the purple loosestrife, what it does, again, it, it, it's suppressing, it, 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 there's competition from the plant side for pollinators and for space. So it takes up all the space and suppresses all of those native plants. You remove the loosestrife and it gives those native plants time, um, the chance to come up. And this is a, a video showing you, um, here's a mimulus. That is a Bombus vegans, which is one of the species of conservation concern and followed by a Bombus fervidus, which is another species of conservation conserve. So with loose strife, I'd see one or two of these um, individuals from these species on red clover with the mimulus last year, we saw, I saw several of each just on the mimulus alone, let alone the other plants that were put in um, at that site. So you don't need to plant, you just need to let things grow up and see what you have and, and try to get rid of those invasives. It's well worth the effort to, to reduce them. 
Um, the other thing is that we, we want to do is, is to limit those non-native flower visitors. So again, if your goal is conservation and you want to conserve biodiversity, the honeybee does not play a role and acts as a competitor. So here's an example. Here we have um, Monarda rubra, right? Um, Monarda rubra is in bloom the last week of July. So the last week of July, the only thing that I observed on Monarda rubra, uh, I observed Bombus, the, the two species at risk, Bombus fervidus and Bombus bagans. The, at the time, there was also um, carpenter bees. So carpenter bees like Bombus aphanus and Bombus trichola are hole biters. So they bite holes at the base of our Monarda rubra um, and they um, steal nectar because they've got a really short tongue. As the frequency of these holes increases, the first week of August, there was a major shift. The honeybees, which were at completely absent now because they have a short tongue, were able to access the nectar and the honeybees, here are the honeybee numbers, right? So honeybees were in the hundreds that first week of August when they were absent before because the carpenter bee, and here's a carpenter bee biting a hole right here, created, opened up the resource and we have hundreds of honeybees and guess what? No, completely deterred the bumblebee species at risk because there's no nectar. It's a limited resource. So they went elsewhere looking for, for nectar. Um, to put it in perspective, a lot of people like Mount Mint and the goldenrods, most goldenrods and definitely Mount Mint don't help at all, even though they're on everybody's list along with Echinacea and, um, and uh, Black-Eyed Susan seem to be a favorite. Um, none of the species at risk, uh, certainly the bumblebees aren't, aren't visiting bumblebee species at risk aren't visiting. What you do see are wasps and honeybees in the hundreds. So if we look at, at our, our mountain mint, a hundred honeybees observed on one plant, 12 common bumblebees and, and none of the at-risk species. So it's like a 10 to one honeybees to, to just, this is the common bumblebee, let alone other bees and, and um, you know, bumblebees at risk. So there's an imbalance just because of the sheer numbers. Again, because the honeybee plays an important role in agriculture, it's all about numbers. When you bring those numbers into an ecological setting, um, you know, there's increased competition and, and there's definitely um, resource um, use changes um, from the, the native species side of things. So uh, the other thing you'd want to do is to focus on those high impact plants. So if we look at native roses, native roses are a good source of pollen for all bees. Certainly the bumblebees in decline love native roses. It's a host plant for the apple sphinx moth and those apple sphinx moths could be food for something like the Eastern whippoorwill. So where we're moving the research is from the pollination system to the connections with between the plant and things at higher trophic levels. So what, what are, how is that plant's existence helping other native species, bird species in particular that are in decline? So trying to, trying to, to, to connect things together um, into these uh, ecological uh, networks. And, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be showy to help. What this means is that a, a lot of these, um, you know, birds love native grass seed versus non-native. So putting in things like blue stem and switchgrass, although they don't, don't look great, well, they look great to some, but they're not showy like a flower, um, are feeding birds. Uh, there are a lot of butterflies that use uh, butterfly species at risk that use them as host plants. In addition, rodents use them for nest sites. Why is that important? Well, for two reasons. First of all, the rodent populations are feeding the bird species at risk, like owls. And also, bumblebees do not make their own nests. They use abandoned rodent nests. So by having good rodent populations uh, and good diversity, that's creating nest sites for our bumblebee species at risk. So Bombus fervidus nests in tall grass and likely uses abandoned rodent nests. And we've, I've got a grad student that's looking into this. Um, but if we don't have rodent surface nesting, then we're not going to have bumblebees uh, on the landscape because they don't have a place to nest. So again, it's not just about the flowers. It's about the complete life cycle um, that we need to support. The nesting habitat, as I mentioned, tall grass, there are some um, cavity nesting bees. There's, there are ground nesting bees. So you want a sandy soil. Um, the butterflies need host plants. We need to make sure they're in there. If we don't have host plants, we're not going to have the butterflies visiting for uh, flowers for nectar. Uh, so we have to make sure we have all aspects of those life cycles and targeting those species that need it. Um, so just to finish with, you know, th this, this, um, the third goal using the data that we've collected to restore and protect last year through COVID, 
I created habitats at three sites this year. I've got um, more sites. So Dartmouth and Southboro were, were two of the sites that I'm showing here, um, putting in plants. So, so um, shrubs and, and plugs uh, in one year, uh, these things bloomed. And in one year, last year, um, guess who showed up when they bloomed? The species at risk. So here are photos of those bumblebee species at risk, Bombus fervus and Bombus vegans at visiting plants on these sites in the first year that we put the plants in. This one's on Pernilla vulgaris. This is on purple giant hyssop, the mimulus, and, and this is um, steeple bush. So um, this, this year we are seeing the same success and we're seeing more of these individuals at these sites. So, you, you know, you can see in the background of Southboro, this isn't a large area, uh, 40 acres, but we're, we're planting a small area and we're making a difference. So it does not take a lot to make a difference. And we're starting to do that. And I hope that um, we'll get other communities across the state to start to put these plants in and start to restore these connections uh, before we lose them. Um, um, I have some videos here. Showy goldenrod is in bloom right now. It's very different than all the other goldenrods supporting species at risk. And I have some, some videos here of, of um, this is the penstemon um, digitalis. That's Bombus thagans. This is Bombus fervus. We're doing some pollination experiments. This is at DNRT, uh, Dartmouth Natural Resources Trust. There's Bombus fervus flying through. Uh, again, we don't you know, I would see these species once in a while on veteran red clover. Now we're bringing them in and re restoring these connections. Um, oh, and there's some voices too. All right. So with that, I have a lot of people to thank and I hope that this list will grow, um, continue to grow over the, the next couple of years and we continue to make positive change. And I'd um, like to thank you for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Oh my goodness. That was absolutely amazing, Rob. Um, it, it's clear that those of us who think we've been doing the right things and who uh, have been working hard, we need to be more sophisticated and we need to do more research. And I, I really thank you for this. Uh, and I thank you for letting us uh, video it because clearly we're going to have to go back to this again and again and uh, ask you for some of the resources you've offered. Yeah. Thank you. A lot, of, a lot of information I try to cram in, but I try to cut things out and I just feel that everything's so important that I I, I can't cut. So I apologize if, if you thought it was a bit too long. But. No, don't think at all. It was very exciting and energizing. And uh, we just, we have the winter, the late fall and winter to, to do work. So thank you. Um, let, let's start with some questions. Uh, oh goodness, where to start? Uh, okay. Uh, unlike some of these areas, uh, we in Newton have, you know, we're an urban area. And we mm -hmm. were very fortunate to, to save some areas like 17 acres of Webster Woods, but we have, we have limited resources here. Uh, is it, and many of us are working in, in our, just our personal yards. Is there, would one yard at a time be enough or does it, did we need to think about, which we have been talking about having a string of yards, sort of making a pathway, a pollinator pathway uh, how much, how much space you say we don't need much space. How much do we need? Right. So, so good question. And there, there are a couple ways you could do it. Let, let me just say that, that I live in, in Framingham in a, in a fairly urban area and I've put these plants in and, and Bombus vegans showed up and I live very close to, to native plant trust and I wouldn't see a vegans because they, wow. again, it comes down to plant selection. So it, it's doable on a small scale. Um, but you have to have a strategy um, what, what, so, so the minimum to put in, and we're, we're studying this is, is a square meter of, of a particular plant species. That's what you want a clump that's around a square meter. And, and what you can do is you can plan with neighbors so that you increase, uh, um, the size of the resource and collectively you're covering everything from spring through, through fall nectar and pollen plants. Yeah. Um, or, or you can put in, um, you know, you can work with your own garden and as long as you have that minimum, um, then, then you're, you're helping clearly, you know, if you can't do everything, I would say to focus on the spring and focus on pollen plants versus nectar plants, because that's really where, where, um, things are lacking. The spring hasn't been a focus. And, and I would say to start there. Um, but yeah, I, I can, I can help guide, um, plant choices and, and, um, for a given area. 
but it, it is doable on a small scale and, and getting creating these pathways certainly will help to expand things out and connect you know we're fragmenting the habitat and so we've got these islands with these species and we want to try to try to connect them and expand those islands to increase the population size so certainly working at the community level and and is a good idea if you can get your neighbors involved Yep, that is great because I have been looking at your lists and I've I've put in many of them in my yard, but I certainly don't have a square meter uh, of these particular plants. So that's going to need to be a change in strategy. Uh, yeah, well, let me let me say that, that you know for bumblebees because they have they're social and they have a colony that they're never full, and so the square meter is is for us, you know the bumblebees being a social species, but certainly you for for other bees and butterflies you can get away with with less. Um, but you definitely need to make sure you're including the host plant and the nectar plant. And those nectar plants need to bloom when the adults are in flight. And if you right. go to my website, it'll tell you when you should have things in bloom for a particular butterfly species at risk. Okay, we, we will do that. Uh, we have a number of questions here. Uh, we have uh, one question. Have you seen that the pollinators life cycle change has come in accordance with the change in bloom times due to climate change? Or have they remained the same? Right. So, so good question. There have been studies um, more in Alpine, like in in the Western U.S. that have have shown this uh, that the plants and the and the bees more in specialized systems are are out of sync. Um, what I am noticing though is that there are certain plants that are um, have a light dependent, so so photoperiod dependent bloom time, and some are temperature dependent. And so the last couple of years, we've had some things that are out of sync where we've had things blooming. And I have noticed that the bees that I normally see them on aren't there. So they were out of sync. Um, so there are some studies on that and, and we're looking at that, but there isn't anything that's, that, that's consistent from year to year. We see it, you know, the odd time, but it's not consistent. Okay. And there's nothing that we really can do about that, except maybe worrying more about covering a, a longer period. Uh, yeah, I know yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I, I've been keeping records in my own yard for about 15 years. And it's incredible to see just within that period, how the bloom time has shifted by about two weeks. It's, it's been on many plants. It's pretty amazing. It, it has been, it has shifted. And, and I think that, you know, that may be contributing to, to decline. It's a hard one to, to nail down. Um, and it's an even harder one to fix, right? Because to change the climate is, um, we're going to have to think of other ways to approach the problem. I think if things are out of sync, we're going to have to figure out the plants that are moving into those spaces that they prefer and try to get them into the habitat to support them. Okay. Maybe we can help with research with that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I have a question that that's, uh, hard for uh, for competing uh, for factions and forces in, for example, our city, because uh, we have very limited sports fields. Uh, there is a big um, motion, a big movement that kids need more and safer and better maintained sports fields. And mm -hmm. Clover is seen as being detrimental. I don't totally understand why, even though I am on the Parks and Rec Commission. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that there are leg twists, the foot twists on it. I, I don't totally get it. But so Clover is being eliminated. Uh, there, there are herbicides being used to take the clover away. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you have to say about that? And what's the solution? <laughs> Well, well certain, certainly I don't mind the clover being removed because it's non-native, but so there's Prunella vulgaris is the native that I would swap it out. So a lot of, you know, changing your lawn and, and, and increasing the function of your lawn, um, the, the Prunella vulgaris is one that I, that I highly recommend. I'm sure that they wouldn't want the Prunella vulgaris in there for the same reason. Um, you know, in terms of what you can do, if they're not throwing pesticides, uh, uh, well, they are throwing herbicides. So, you know, trying to create um, strips um, might be one solution or, or habitats. As I said, it doesn't take a lot. Um, but if you're killing everything but the grass, it's, it's, it's a hard one. Um, okay. you're, you're, you're basically, you'd have to put in s some strips. Uh, to, you know, you'd have to re replace that resource in some way. 
with, with that's one thing we're arguing that maybe you take out the center of the fields, but then you do strips, you do an area around it, yeah. uh, a compensating area. Right. So that that's that's reasonable. Um, I, I think a reasonable request in the way that I would do it is to say, OK, what what's a high traffic area? And you could do what you want with this area, but we're going to take this area and we're going to we're going to protect it where there's less traffic. And, and, and it's all about strategy. It's the same with mowing. Right. So you don't want to go in and just mow everything. Um, you want to figure out what you want to keep, flag it and then mow around it and then just don't mow everything. You want to mow it in in strips and chunks. So you're always leaving some habitat. It's the same idea here. I think that you would want to um, keep an area, but then you have other areas that you're not going to um, you just don't have this blanket approach to it. You'd need to try to, to save some of it, um, I would say, would be the best approach. But I would also swap out the clover with prunella because the, the, the species that need it aren't, aren't visiting the clover. That's all honeybees and, and bombus and page, the common bumblebee. Um, okay. So the prunella though is, is catering to a, a, a wider array of, of um, flower visitor and is something that I would put in instead. Terrific. It's e easy to seed and throw down the seed and you'll get it blooming within the first year. So it's, it's pretty good. For that. Fantastic. Uh, we have uh, Marion asking us here, all your plant examples look like they are in the sun. Are there some bees that like shade plants? My yard is mostly in the shade. Yeah. So if you look at the list, I have a lot of shade, part shade and full shade plants. So there's um, wood mint is one that is pretty much a full shade plant that is a really good resource to put in. Um, I have it in this year. It's, it's one of those plants that I'm watching that I think I'm going to add to the list uh, but there's certainly some shade tolerant plants on the list. You just have to go down and, you know, I, I, I try to put as much information as I could for each of the plants, but some of them may take more research, but, but lighting condition, whether it's full, full sun, shade, part shade is all there. You just need to go down, go down the list and find some that match. Terrific. Uh, we have another question. You say showy goldenrod is different from other goldenrod species. Yeah. Can you explain farther? Yeah. So um, tons of goldenrod, different species don't ever see species at risk. Showy goldenrod, I, I see the, not only the species, but queens of the species. Um, butterflies. So I have a student that's, that's working on butterflies. Um, no butterflies on acres and acres of goldenrod, typical goldenrod, showy goldenrod, five, six, seven monarchs on a single plant type thing. So there's a considerable difference in activity, um, likely because of the nectar that it produces. Um, maybe there's something else to it, but we're looking into it, but there's a very clear difference between showy goldenrod and the other goldenrods controlling for the amount of the resource. Okay. Uh, oh, I had a question. Uh, I see that someone's asking about a name, but when you talked about the German word uh, for looking yeah. at it from the perspective <laughs> of the animals, could yeah. you tell us that again, please? Uh, it's umwelt, U-M-W-E-L-T, I believe is the Okay. Yeah, my, my German, I'm not German and my German's terrible. So I'm sure it's not pronounced the way I'm pronouncing it, but if you wanted to help me out with it, but that, that's it. That's okay. it's a yeah. neat word. Okay. You'll head us in the right direction on that. Thank Dugan you. Dugan Roo is the other one. Migratory restlessness. That's, that's when I talk about migration. So, okay. Tell us that please. Oh, no, no. I, it's called Zugan Roo, which is migratory restlessness is the okay. birds <laughs> during migration are active at night. So anyway. Okay. Thank I you. Digress. Yeah. No, fun digressions. <laughs> uh, okay. Suzette, who's an amazing gardener, asks us here, is it also true that cultivars, cultivars of bee bomb should not be used? And if so, what is the native bee bomb that should be planted? Uh, excellent question. So, so there are definitely, um, so again, it's about the pollination and not feeding the bees. So there are cultivars of bee balm that I have seen species at risk on. Um, but in terms of seed production and, and whether the seed's good and whether it's a good host plant, I haven't looked into it. So for straight species, Monarda fistulosa is, is a good one. And, and uh, Monarda didyma is the other one. And then Monarda fistulosa rubra, which is a subspecies. And that's the one that I showed you when I was talking about the, the honeybees and the carpenter bees biting the holes. Um, right. As far as I know, that's a, that's a subspecies. And so that, that's a good one um, as well. Okay. But Thank the spot, spotted bee bomb is not good. 
it does not, it's, it's all common species and not the species that need it. Um, so that one, it's not all monarders are not the same, just like all. Oh, no, no. I just put some in. Oh, well, I guess well, that's going to be a short lived so, plant. Yeah, let me say, I, I, and I'm not promoting that everybody go and rip up their gardens and put everything on my list. All I'm saying is if you have space yep. and you can add some of the plants in the list that you'll be helping, or you can cut back, like a lot of people have a ton of mountain mint and mountain mint has zero value um, when it comes to the, the conservation. And so if you cut it back, you can keep the mountain mint, but then make some space for something else that would then help to support the species that um, that need it. That's and it spreads so much. So, and this year right. I've been taking videos of mountain mint, uh, and it's incredible that it's about half, uh, impatience and it's about half honeybees and I have seen right. nothing else on it. I want, there are some wasps. Um, there may be the odd butterfly, but not anything that is like, um, if you put in a, an artificial losa at the time, there's no comparison in terms of activity um, and diversity that you see on a, on a Menard officiolosa versus bee bomb echinacea um, or, or the black eyed Susan. If you, if you look at the amount of black eyed Susan out there, it's really, really low on the list of even supporting common species. So yep. um, again, it's, it's look at the numbers, but also look at the diversity and it sounds like you're doing a good job. I being those bees to make sure that you have something other than impatience and honeybees. We try, we try, yeah. and we'll all try harder. Yeah. Uh, and another excellent gardener says here, as host plant, I almost never find monarch caterpillars on any milkweed other than common milkweed. Is there an explanation for this? Um, yeah, so so leaf leaf chemistry um, definitely pl plays a role. So those those species are different. Um, and I have noticed that as well. Um, I know that people that raise monarchs use the, um, the tropical milkweed that they seem, um, but it, it all comes down to, to the chemistry. Um, and, and I suspect that that chemistry differs between the two. And that's probably why you're seeing them more on the common. It's, it's interesting. They're laying eggs. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. They love, uh, the incarnata in my yard. And today I found a poor, uh, on the, uh, butterfly weed, uh, on the tuberosa. I found a poor monarch caterpillar today. I thought, Oh, okay. you have missed your timing so badly. Uh, but it seemed very happy on the butterfly weed. <laughs> yeah, no, they do visit it. It's not, you know, and, and also it could be for whatever reason that the, the, um, the swamp milkweed that you have just doesn't, the soil conditions aren't right, which is affecting the chemistry. So there's, there's definitely something up with the, the chemistry that would, that would affect it. Like, then that's what the problem with the cultivars is, is that you change the chemistry or you change the nectar production and you don't know it and, and they avoid it. Um, so. Terrific. Okay. We have a complicated one here from Alice that I'm going to try to get through and I'm going to read it. Uh, or summarize it at least as I go through. Uh, okay. She's reporting a recent exchange on next door in her neighborhood about an attack by ground nesting bees. Uh, she said someone who seemed well informed had the last word. But what else should be we should should we be saying to people who see bees as a threat? Uh, she said there was a report of it being an angry. Uh, bees from a ground bee nest along Wabin Avenue that resulted in multiple st stings to which mm -hmm. police and EMT uh, responded. Then someone else said bees do not live in the ground, which is not true. <laughs> it was a wasp right. nest. And then someone else said bees do indeed live in the ground. Many varieties of native bees, but they will not try to sting unless disturbed. Okay. So great question. The first of all, there is a good chance that it was a a wasp uh, nest. Wasps are much, much more aggressive than bees, but I will say that, you know, if you mess with the nest, that's the only time that, that bees become aggressive. And, and you know, each bee has a job to do, and there are certain bees that their job is to guard the nest. And whenever there's a vibration that disturbs the nest, they're going to go out and they're going to sting the first thing that moves. That's, that's the way they defend their home, if you think of it like that. So I would say that the first thing is to, to figure out whether you have a wasp or a bee, either way, you know, um, that these things are going to happen. They they're nesting in abandoned rodent nests. If it's a bumblebee, 
and um, you know, mowing the lawn. If you walk over it, it's not really going to affect, it wouldn't sting you. So it would take some major vibration to get them to, to sting you. Wasps are more temperamental and they're more likely to sting you. Um, but I, there are far more examples of wasps doing that than, than bees, but certainly bees nest in the ground and bumblebees nest in the ground. They're social. There are many solitary bees that nest in the ground. Some of them sting, some of them don't sting. Um, so what do you do about it? Um, I would say in the spring, all of the queens are looking for nest sites. So if you see a wasp that's near your gutter or you see something flying around the ground and going in that they're finding, that's where they start the nest. And you only have to deal with one individual, even though it's a large individual and you could try to deter it um, from that point. Um, but, but anyway, I'm not sure if there was a question asked or. Oh, I think it was just for you to comment, comment, which you've yeah, done yeah. wonderfully. So, so I, uh, by the way, if you ever find a bumblebee nest, I've, I take them out of the ground or, you know, I've taken them out of air conditioning units under decks. So, and then I bring them into the lab and study them. So if you do see a bumblebee nest um, and you want to get rid of it, then just email me and I might, might be able to get at it and take it out for you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have a tricky question here. Uh, if some bumblebee species are fully replacing those we are losing, why is having a diversity of species important? Because the, again, because the, those species that are missing are pollinating certain plants that the other ones don't. So we're losing their function as pollinators, which is the, uh, um, the, the, the key to all of this. So you lose the bee, you lose one species, you lose the, its role as a pollinator, and you can think of it as affecting many, many species. Um, so they, they are not replacing, um, they're increasing in number and possibly filling the niche to some degree, but their short medium tongue bees are not replacing the, the niche of a long tongue bee. And uh, those long tongue bees, there are plants that are specifically targeting those long tongue bees for pollination. And those pollination products are feeding, let's say they're feeding a specific group of birds or small mammals. And so when you, um, you, you, you need those species back to form those natural connections. I think that's one of the most valuable things you've given us out of lots of valuable things to, to help us understand uh, what we need to do. Thank you. We have more questions. I wish we could get to all of them, but our, our time is, uh, is up here. And I want to thank everybody uh, very much for participating. Most of all, I want to thank you, Dr. Jagir, for this was absolutely amazing. If you have more questions, you may submit them to Dr. Jagir at rjagir at umassd.edu. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jagir. Thank you, Thank Alan. You. Thank you all our co-sponsors. And good night, everyone. Yes, good night. Thank you again for attending my uh, talk and the invitation. Too.